Hello, hello, everybody. Hello. Apologies for interrupting conversations, but we are about to get started. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for the uh, Spring 1L Academic Advising Session. At this session, we actually, yeah, thank you. Someone cheered in the back. That was very, very kind. Um, so we have uh, a packed agenda, actually, for you today. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about the overall agenda. And then very quickly, we're going to talk a little bit about, from there, we're going to talk about mechanics and actual graduation requirements. Um, you have some graduation requirements that are a little distinct from some of your predecessors so and some of the upper level students. So the registrar's office will cover that. Uh, our associate dean, Paul George, and our two deputy deans, Polk Wagner and Sophia Lee, will also provide some broad kind of guidance as you think a little bit about your 2L and 3L years. Believe it or not, um, you have two more years of law school, and uh, there are uh, a lot of options that you have in front of you. And then following that, we also have a wonderful panel of faculty who will be presenting flash talks on different areas of the uh, curriculum. So you'll be hearing a little bit about health law, international law, our clinical programs. Um, so we have a packed agenda, um, and that's, that's where we stand right now. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Federico, who is a wonderful colleague of mine in the Registrar's Office, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about specific graduation requirements that you have coming up. So let me just get on here. Nicole, please, the floor is yours. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, if you don't already know me, I am Nicole Federico, and I work in the Registrar's Office. So um, I pass around a handout for all of you to take a look at. This is your cheat sheet for registration, important dates, the calendar for next year, as well as graduation requirements. I'm going to start with the dates that are at the top. If I were you, I would put these on my personal calendar. Um, the week of June 12th is when the curriculum for next year is scheduled to go out. It will go out by email from our office. It will go out sometime that week. So if it is the 12th and you don't receive it, don't panic. It might be on that Friday, OK? Um, the next date is June 19th. This is the date that advanced registration will open. The following date is July 14th, and that is the date that advanced registration closes. So important thing to remember, you can enter your requests on the very first day or the very last day. It does not matter in terms of advantage over which classes you will get. So you can schedule it according to your personal schedule, whatever day works best for you. Just make sure you get in your requests prior to July 14th. Can you change your request during that time? Absolutely. Um, just make sure that your final decision on course selection is in place July 14th, OK? All right, so how to register. You guys have done this this past semester, but you weren't really competing the way you were, are going to be competing this fall. So I always get the question, Nicole, how do I game the system? How do I get into the class that everybody wants? I'm sorry to say, you guys are two L's. You guys are going to be competing in the hardest place to get into classes. So the three L's, LLMs, are going to have priority because they only have one, one year left, OK? But you can compete wisely against your 2L colleagues, all right? So first, log on to Pen & Touch to do um, advanced registration. That's how you participate. You're going to rank your courses. It absolutely matters what position you put your classes. The first primary position, that is your ace. That's where you're going to put the class that you want the most, all right? The system works in order, which is very important to remember. The registrar's office always tells students, make sure you have an alternate request for every primary request you have. You might say, Nicole, why do I need that? I'll just put my primaries in. I'm on the wait list for all of my primary courses. Why do I need an alternate? The reason you need an alternate is because your first alternate is a higher bid than your second primary. So if you're unsuccessful in getting into your first primary, the system's going to go to your first alternate. Well, if you don't have a first alternate, your colleague that puts a first alternate choice and you did not, your colleague's going to have a better chance. 
okay? So I strongly recommend you have an alternate for every single class. This, um, I guess this strategy sounds a little confusing when explaining it. So I put a little chart at the bottom which illustrates what the registrar's advice is when it comes to how to register for classes. Remember that any class you selected as a primary request that you did not get enrolled in, you will automatically be placed on the wait list for. You will not be placed on the wait list for any alternate class, so keep that in mind. Um, when you go to make your selections during advanced registration, record which classes that you actually registered for. I get the question all the time. All right. I'm here for the wait list. Can you tell me what wait list I'm on? I can't. We have no way to look it up by student name. We can only go by course title. So if you record which classes you entered, you can go in and you can say, hey, Nicole, I tried to get into this class, but I was unsuccessful. Can you check it for me? And I'm going to say, absolutely. Um, there is no way to check which classes you registered for after advanced registration closes which is why we recommend that you record your choices. The next question I get all the time, Nicole, there is no submit button. How do I know my classes went in? Um, I, my only advice is take a deep breath and relax. As long as you have your choices in place at the close of advanced registration, your requests will be um, sent to the advanced registration system and everything will go according to plan. If you miss the boat, then you're going to have to email us and we're going to have to put your requests in manually. But as long as you put your requests in during the advanced registration period, you're all set. Okay? The other question I get all the time, Nicole, I want to take a non-law class. How do I put that in advanced registration? You don't. <laughs> Advanced registration is only for your law classes, okay? We strongly recommend that you always have a full law school course load before trying to register for any non-law class, okay? And I'm not gonna get into full non-law uh, registration right now because we do have a comprehensive uh, instru instructions online for that, so I won't go into that now. But we will field questions for that at the office if you have any further questions regarding that issue. Um, additional resources. So students always ask me, how do I know which classes are most popular? How do I know what my chances are of getting in? I'm going to strongly recommend that you check out our resources online. We have the course offering spreadsheet, which is, also, which is going to be sent to you guys by email from Claire. It will also be posted online. Our resources for advanced registration, if you go to academics, Go down to the registrar's page and then go to scroll down. You guys are Penn Law students, you're going to click on that tab. And under course registration, if you click registration for upper level students, here is a wealth of knowledge to help you with your registration. We have the curriculum which is going to be listed as course list. Block schedules will be posted once they're available. Um, Ever, all of the information on clinical courses, externships, what an independent study is, um, the course finder, your academic advising curriculum compass is available, faculty bios, if you really want to study with a particular professor, um, all of that information is up here. Advanced registration archives, this is where you're going to see how competitive a class is to get into. It'll tell you if a class closed out, It'll tell you if um, they accepted, if it's a large class, maybe it has 100 seats or maybe it only has 25. Um, it'll have that information for past semesters. We can never tell you how popular a course is going to be until people actually register for it, but you can gauge um, approximate popularity by these past results. Now, degree requirements. You guys should always keep in mind the degree requirements when you are registering. So as you guys probably know, 86 credits are required to receive the JD degree. Of those 86, you are required to take six experiential learning credits. Now this is a new requirement that was instituted by the ABA and is effective with you guys. 
Um, what does that mean? That means before you graduate, you have to take six credits in experiential learning. Nicole, is that hard? Um, here's the answer. We have nearly 60 courses that are approved for uh, experiential learning credit, okay? It, those include every clinic and every externship. We wanted to see how difficult this new requirement would be. Right now, without even trying, our current students are at an 80% success rate of meeting or exceeding this requirement. So all it takes is a little planning and making sure that you are ticking the boxes prior to graduation. Now, how are you gonna know if it's an experiential learning class? You're going to check the annotated course planning spreadsheet that's going to be sent out by Claire, our registrar, and it will also be posted online. To help you guys navigate this new requirement, we are also having a drop-down searchable option with the course finder. So you'll be able to search by that requirement. So that is also helpful. If you have additional questions about how to go about this, email us. Come into our office. If you don't see anybody up front and I, my door is open, come knock on my door. You can knock on my door anytime. I'm a very open person. <laughs> so feel free to come and ask questions. Um, before you graduate, you also have to take professional responsibility. I always tell, tell 2Ls, you know, some of the smaller seminars might be difficult to get into as a 2L. Why not get professional responsibility out of the way? You have to take it. So um, if you're struggling as to figuring out what you might want to take next, next year, maybe professional responsibility is an option to get it out of the way. You will also need to complete a senior writing requirement. Many students do this through a journal comment or a smaller seminar that is paper-based. Um, additional information on that is available on our website as well as in our office. If you have specific questions, come see me. Um, and then you are allowed to take a maximum of 22 co-curricular credits. I have the breakdown there um, on the sheet so you can look at that further. And never forget about the pro bono requirement which you also need for graduation. So that's kind of the rundown, the summary of the nuts and bolts of how to make it through the JD degree and how to register for advanced registration uh, this upcoming semester. Um, the other question I usually get is, okay, so advanced registration ends in July. When do I find out my classes? Usually around early August. Um, we don't have a specific date, but it's usually around early August. Um, I'm happy to field some questions if you guys have questions. Yes. Questions. Yes. So when the course curriculum spreadsheet goes out, every class that might have multiple sections, let's say there's four sections of corporations, each section will have a section number at the end. So the course number is going to be the first three digits. The section, section number is the last three digits. Make sure that those last three digits match up with the professor you want to take. An option when you go to register, it'll say section any. Um, if you select section any, if you're unsuccessful in getting into the section you wanted with a particular professor, it will try to place you in another section of the same course. If you do not select that, and let's say you really wanted to take corporations with Professor Bratton, and you were unsuccessful, and you said, no, I don't want to take it with anybody else, it'll go to your next request. It will not try to place you in an, in an additional section of corporations. Additional questions? Anyone? If you, if you do have questions and um, you think of them later, please come see me. I'm happy to talk to anyone. Okay. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you very much, Nicole. <laughs> All right. So everybody, buckle your seatbelts. Hold on tight. We are now going to talk a little bit about the thrill ride that is substantive academic advising. Um, and to get us started on that front, uh, we have our Associate Dean, Paul George, who'll provide you with some general broad brushstrokes guidance on how to think a little bit about your 2L and 3L years and, um, and the sort of guidance that could be useful on that front. Please. Uh, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to be here with you. I am. I think the the key phrase was broad brushstrokes. That's what I was describing. So I'm not going to tell you that if you want to work in firm X and these are the seven courses you have to take before you graduate. 
Um, I sort of look at the things as um, um, a theme of what to consider, and I have sort of two. One is mix it up and think of the experience. So why do I think about mix it up? I like to categorize things. I don't know that's because I'm a librarian or I'm a lawyer, but if you look at the curriculum, there are, like, I don't know, like 250 courses, a huge number, and it may look overwhelming, but start breaking it down. Well, you have courses that are large lectures, so you've had lecture courses now as a 1L, but you also have the opportunity starting next year to take seminars. These are limited to 14 people. You're working very closely with that faculty member. You have um, uh, externships and you have clinics, so those are different ways to categorize the courses. You also have courses that are substantive law, of securities, corporations, land use planning. You have the skills courses, advanced legal research, appellate advocacy, trial advocacy. There are other skill courses which sound like substantive law, but we were squeezing them into skills courses. So different categories. Uh, other categories you can divide things up to. You have uh, courses taught by the full-time faculty members. We all also have adjunct faculty members. These are people who are members of the, of the bar. They're practicing attorneys in the from Delaware, or actually from DC, pretty much up to New York. Uh, they may be judges. Um, they're, they, are, they bring to us an incredible amount of experience um, in what they do, and they actually allow you to focus on very specific, narrow areas of law. So often, I encourage students to go and say, well, I have my, my large survey course, and I have my seminar with the adjunct or the, faculty, or the standing faculty member. Um, and even within the idea of taking courses with my faculty member deciding, there are many times, I think some of you, I, I, I guess a high number of you actually will take a course because you love Professor X, this is a wonderful person, and you don't really care so much about the, what that person's teaching. <laughs> I mean, you may not have, a, that may not be an area you want to practice in, but you think the professor is so great, you want to learn from that person's style of teaching, view of law, that's a, that's a perfectly acceptable and, and admirable uh, goal to have. You also have large courses and small courses, so corporations is going to be huge. Other courses are going to be small, give you time to work with somebody. Um, you have domestic law, international law. So there are all sorts of ways to start breaking the courses down when you think of how can I choose from all these things? Why am I looking at these categories? Um, because I think what I like for you to do is really think, what is your law school experience? Um, that's why five years from now you're going to think, I had a great course with Professor X. Um, I knew I was never going to practice that area of law, but it was a fantastic course. I learned a lot. I learned how to perceive the law. I learned how to think. You are not going to think five years from now about the moment you learned about what the rule of perpet against perpetuities meant. Now, you will not learn that. You don't know what it is now. I, never, I can't tell you what it is now. <laughs> I, I never knew it for the, law, for the bar exam. So that moment when certain things click, you're not going to care about a few years from now. You are going to care about that experience. So that's why I say the thing to think about is, think about professors you want to work with and how you can get to know them better. Uh, that may be through a small course with them through the, or through the seminar. Uh, work with the adjuncts. Have, so have this mixture of professors or standing faculty members and staff and adjunct faculty members. Take a clinic. You know, even if you think I'm not going to really do that, think what the clinic can gain you, you in your own personal experience. I've known of students who said, I really am not comfortable speaking in public. I'm going to take trial advocacy because that's going to force me to stand up. I'm going to take a clinic that's going to force me to stand up and do something like that. Um, and it gives you the chance to actually apply what you're learning. See, it, um, take something outside your field of comfort. Don't stay always within what you th you're most comfortable with. Challenge yourself, um, whether that's your ability to write, your ability to speak. Uh, build upon skills you think you might need for the, your first job as well as those you think you don't have. So that's one of the reasons I can't give you advice if you need to do these seven courses because you yourself need to decide what your own strengths are and what your weaknesses are. Um, ask yourself, can I learn from this course beyond the substantive law? Again, it's back to what can that professor provide you? What are the experiences? Um, uh, we mentioned the opportunity to take courses outside the law school, so think about those. You can take four classes outside the law school. Um, how can you, unless you take the Wharton certificate, in which case okay, you take that plus two others. Um, but think what those can provide you as well. And then also consider what all you have to do in terms of your other opportunities. So you have your center professionalism opportunities going forward. Um, and one of the sort of organizations you have, if you're going to be on journal, how busy you're going to be. Um, with that, I will say you know, there are some, you know, you, you, Nicole mentioned you have to take professional responsibility, you have to take those six uh, skills credits. Um, I would say you have to take corporations. It's not on a graduation requirement, but you have to take corporations, so don't think about getting around it. 
Um, and I say that as a public interest lawyer who, did ne who never worked for a big business, but no matter what field of practice you're going to have, I think corporations is vital for um, your area of law. I would actually encourage tax. I think as people don't always agree with me, or students don't always agree with me, but I think it really gives you the experience of understanding how a, a complicated statutory and regulatory system works and how you can bring that in together. Um, so those are really sort of my sort of, you should take courses. I, I have some don'ts. Um, don't focus on any one of these categories. Don't take all lecture courses. Don't take all seminar courses. Um, again, mix it up. It's, it, sort of think, what is this package going to present to, to my future to an employer when they sort of see the trans, transcript? Um, I have a view that don't take a course just because it's on the bar exam. Okay, so um, now some you could take that too far and not take any courses that are on the bar exam and be in trouble, but since I've already told you to take corporations, you're going to do that. Um, but there are certain courses you can, you know, you've, I've heard people say, and we all have our own course. I won't mention what my course was. I, did, I refused to take, and I just learned it from the Barbary. I knew I was never going to need it. So don't spend your time doing that. Um, and my one other don't is don't overburden yourself. Many of you are going to be on journals. You're going to have other activities. You have time. You will get into the courses you want pretty much. <laughs> And um, so just take into account what else you are doing. Are you doing an externship that's more hours than you would normally be working for the course for the same amount of credit? You know, are you going to be on a journal? Are you going to be doing a lot of pro bono next year? Um, and so th that's sort of really sort of my broad overstrokes. Think about the mixture of courses and think about the experience. Great. For the deputy deans, if you have additional counsel to offer on this one. Um, I will keep this very brief, and it's mostly repeating and maybe amplifying a couple of the points that I think sometimes students miss. Um, one is, despite the competitiveness of them, I strongly encourage you to take a seminar in your 2L year and maybe even in the fall of your 2L year. Um, these are really rare opportunities to build a stronger relationship with a particular faculty member who's going to know you well after that class in a way that is just very hard unless you've worked for someone as a research assistant to ever happen in a large class. And those are people who will be your mentors through the rest of law school, who will give you advice on classes. They are people who will be recommenders for you and write lengthy, very informed letters on your behalf for different jobs you may want, including clerkships. So um, I, would not, uh, I would not overlook the value, just the relationship value, as well as the intellectual value of a seminar. Um, the other point I just wanted to emphasize is the clinics as uh, something to take some time before you graduate, no matter whether you think you're going to be a public interest lawyer or not. And the clinics are really a place, there's great skills training in the other classes that are more specialized, but the, the clinics are going to give you an overall training as a lawyer in a whole range of lawyering skills with a depth and intensity you will not find anywhere else in law school. And those lessons are going to be useful to you no matter what you do. So I would just really encourage you to think about including a clinic as part of your full, uh, full career here at the law school. And the last thing I would say is it can become, uh, you can become very focused on specialization. And I would just also encourage you to remember that this may be the last time you will be in school in the rest of your life. So uh, maybe try to build in something that you do just because You've always loved X, and that might be something you take outside the law school, that might be something you take inside the law school, but, uh, but don't let this last uh, bit of education go by without doing something just for the uh, intellectual value of it. So I, I feel pretty unqualified to advise anyone in courses since I did manage to get out of law school without taking corporations um, or, <laughs> or administrative law and then immediately started a clerkship that required a lot of administrative law. My judge said, what on earth did you do? Um, so I guess I would amplify a couple of things that, that Paul said. One is don't take courses just because they're on the bar. And like if you want to take the course anyway, that's great, but don't spend any time taking your uh, your valuable coursework time for a bar class. Um, I would also say to, to echo something that, that Sophia said, that this is an opportunity to really find some serendipity and, and take some courses that you don't think you're going to be interested in, but you've heard good things about them or something that, 
that because you never know you're going to use you're going to learn from different styles you might find that you're in fact really interested in that area of law that you really didn't even know yet so don't be afraid to sort of branch out um, and that goes to sort of a different point and and um, you know Paul said don't overburden yourself I sort of think that this is your shot at burdening yourself right you have two more years here um, you've got, you know, a limited set of time and courses, and let's be serious, this is really not that hard, right? Like, you can take a full load here without breaking a sweat. You all got here, um, you can certainly handle, uh, the work. Um, seriously. Um, <laughs> so, you know, don't hesitate to take that extra class and, 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 uh, enjoy it. And then the other thing that, to to advice that I would give is if you see something, particularly in your third year, if there are seminars or specialized courses that you would like that we don't offer, tell us, right? The three of us up here spend a lot of time talking about courses, about things that we should offer, things we don't offer, things that seem popular, courses that don't seem popular. We love to hear the feedback, and if there are courses that a significant number of students really want, then we'll find a way to teach that course, whether it's using a, a standing faculty member who's otherwise uh, got some openings in their schedule or finding an adjunct faculty member to come in and teach it. Um, you know, this is, this is a, a law school that's not very large and we do uh, take the feedback that you have seriously and we really wanna hear what, what courses you want to take with, that, that are gonna be meaningful to you. So that's the set of advice I give. So. Great, great, very good. So we are now moving into our flash talk of the, uh, the event, and uh, as a little bit of a wrinkle, when I sent an email to the professors about two weeks ago, I feel like there's only a certain musical piece to play that best tries to summarize what it is we were attempting to do. So we emailed professors two weeks ago and said, can you speak about your subject area in four to five minutes? For some professors, this proved to be mission impossible, and we received responses like, I need at least two hours and 200 pages to talk about my subject area. But the professors we've assembled here are all willing to try to opine on their specific subject area in four to five minutes. Um, some might consider that mission impossible. For the folks you'll be hearing from today, this is very much mission impossible. Um, so with that in mind, I will stop the music, and I will go very quickly into our first flash talk. It'll be by Professor Eric Feldman, who'll be speaking a little bit about health law. I actually have time limit signs, one minute and time's up, that every professor has very graciously um, um, been willing to follow. So with no further ado, Professor Feldman, you're up to talk a little bit about health law. Thank you. And just for the record, I also made it through law school without taking corporations. Perhaps that'll be a trend. Uh, health law, four, four questions, four to five minutes. What is health law? Why should you study health law at Penn? What classes do, do we offer in the area of health law? And where will the study of health law lead you? So number one, what is health law? Health law, huge, diverse field, addresses the full range of issues involved in the provision of health care services in the US and globally access to care, bioethics and medical ethics issues, particularly at the beginning and end of life, uh, insurance coverage, pharmaceutical safety, food safety, disease prevention and treatment, many, many other areas. Because spending on health care in the US amounts to about 18% of our GDP, so close to 20%. Uh, you can imagine both the economic implications of the area of health law as well as the implications and importance for individual and uh, more general public health. Why should you study health law at Penn? I already gave you part of the answer. Incredibly important economically and extraordinarily important in terms of individual well-being. Beyond that, look no further than the recent fights over the Affordable Care Act to appreciate how important health law is to the central issues of public policy in this country. The fight about whether we should get rid of, amend, keep, change uh, the Affordable Care Act, the so-called Obama plan. Uh, Health care is so important, in fact, that perhaps without you realizing it, we've smuggled it into the curriculum in almost all of your classes. None of you have gotten through the first year without learning about health law in contracts, in torts, in constitutional law, some of you in administrative law, surely in criminal law. 
and you're going to continue to bump up against health law in corporations, if you take it, uh, in labor law and insurance law and professional responsibility and many other classes. So I think the question isn't should you study health law, you're already studying it. The question you need to answer is to what degree you want to discipline and focus your study of health law or to what degree you want to bump into it here and there in a range of classes. That's a question I think only you can answer. For those of you interested in pursuing in a more rigorous way health law, we have a huge range of offerings both within and beyond the law school at Penn. Inside the law school, we have classes that look at health care financing, mental health law, FDA law and policy, disability law, public health law, a class called Doctors' Death Panels and Democracy, a range of clinical opportunities, often in the transnational clinic, in the child welfare clinic, uh, in the intellectual property clinic, one confronts health care law in a quite rigorous way. Outside the law school at Wharton, there's a large program in health care management. In the medical school, there's a Department of Health Policy and Medical Ethics. And to give you a sense of the dynamism and growth in this area, they're likely to be hiring five new faculty in that department, two with JDs, one a graduate of ours this year. The Annenberg School has lots going on in the healthcare area. The School of Design and City Planning and Hospital Planning. Uh, the School of Policy and Practice, what we call SP2. So almost without fail across the professional schools at Penn, as well as in the undergraduate and schools of social science, you will find health law offerings. When we bill ourselves as a law school that takes interdisciplinary studies seriously, this is what we mean. Where is it going to lead you? What sort of jobs? May all sound good, may all sound fun and exciting, but will you be an unemployed person? Uh, absolutely not. I, I can't think of a professional setting where there are lawyers uh, where there's not health law practice. Federal, state, and local government, large private practice law firms, advocacy nonprofits, legal services organizations, public interest law firms, and more. There are externship opportunities. The general counsel's office of the Children's Hospital at Penn or the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania both have externship possibilities. There are a range of summer positions available for those resourceful enough to find them in the healthcare area, not just for two L's, but very much for one L's. Some of the most distinguished and successful alums of this law school, both in Philadelphia and beyond, work in the healthcare area. So I would urge you, use our network, go work with them, go learn from them, go overtake them and surpass them professionally. Most of all, and perhaps this echoes what's been said, uh, as you're thinking about what to do in law school, let your interests be your guide. Not what you think you ought to take, not what the bar tells you to take, not what any of us tell you to take. I will say within the healthcare area, there is almost always something for everyone, given how broad the field. So find your niche and pursue it. To the extent that you're interested in talking further about this, I'm always available up in my office. There are a range of other people on the faculty who you either know or can find on the website who work in the area. All of us would certainly be happy to help. Thanks. I hope that was less than five. Very well done. <laughs> Professor Feldman clocked in at four minutes, 50 seconds. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> Um, next, we'll hear from Professor Lee, who will talk a little bit about uh, administrative and regulatory law. All right. Well, in some ways, I could just stop talking now, because really, everyone who's talking to you today in their flash talk is talking to you about doing administrative and regulatory law. So it's, all, it's already, you're going to hear about it, even if I don't say another word. Um, but I am going to say a few more words, and I'm going to talk about what it means to take classes in administration and, uh, and regulatory law, uh, why you should take those classes, what classes you should take, and then a little bit about who maybe will take some versus others of those. Uh, so what is it? Hopefully you all have a little bit of an idea of this since you should all be in a, a regulatory elective now, right? But the basic classes, administrative law, just a nutshell kind of thumbnail sketch description, administrative law is about how law regulates the government. So here you will learn about the various legal systems that constrain how the government goes about governing. 
If you take a legislation class, also part of this package, here you will learn about statutes, how they get made, how they get interpreted and implemented. If you take a class in regula regulation, regulatory policy, you're going to be probably looking more inside the agency, looking at how agencies take those tools, statutes, take the legal uh, infrastructure they have to operate within administrative law, and then take all their areas of expertise to create policies that are going to govern everyday life. So that's what, the, that's what administrative and regulatory law is at the most general level. Why should you take it? Well, here you're going to hear another pitch of something you should not leave law school without taking. I would say you should not leave law school without taking administrative law and without taking legislation. And that's because we are, as many legal scholars have long recognized, a nation of statutes. At least for the 20th century, this has been the case, which means we are also a nation with a lot of administering by agencies and a lot of regulations. So if you want to understand how law works in this country, you really need to understand what a statute is, how it gets interpreted, and then implemented, and then what the legal constraints are on government uh, when it's doing those things. Uh, I would also say, again, this is a real meta set of skills, point, you know, proven in the fact that every single one of these flash talks is going to touch on an area of law that is heavily regulatory. Right? So whether you're going to do public interest law, housing, environmental law, child welfare, immigration law, labor and employment law, civil rights law, these are all areas where you are going to have to be doing administrative and regulatory law and understand how that works. Uh, if you're going to go into private practice, you're going to be doing transactional work. Guess what? Really important to know how regulations work, know regulatory law, because you're going to have to draft contracts that are compliant with that whole body of law out there. Securities regulation, pretty obvious right there. Even real estate, property. I was thinking before this, is there any area of practice I can think of that does not involve administration and regulation? And honestly, I cannot. OK, so that's what it is. That's why I take it. What should you take? OK, again, basic courses. I think everybody should take some time in law school, administrative law, legislation. OK, those are just need to know it for whatever you're going to do. You don't want to end up like, uh, like Polk in your clerkship having no idea uh, what Chevron is, OK? Still uh, don't. Still don't. Yeah. <laughs> OK, but what about beyond that? So more advanced offerings that we have here. Uh, there are advanced regulatory policy seminars that Professor Colonese runs that you can do everything from write and generate content for RegBlog, now the regulatory review on these issues, to studying more, again, inside, the re inside agencies and how they go about regulating. Uh, there are advanced statutory interpretation seminars from Professor Gelbach and Professor Dorfler uh, that I'd recommend. There are also a, a range of clinics and externships. So we have a legislative clinic where you can learn on the ground how statutes are made by going and working in Congress or for a state legislator. Uh, there are lots of externships. You can go work in a government agency and see what it means to be doing this kind of work from the inside. Uh, we have DC field trips where you can go down and have a crash course with all the different people involved in a particular policy area, tax policy, for instance. Um, and then there are all the advanced classes as in any one of these heavily regulated areas of law, sec reg, tax, health, environmental law, patent law. So there are many ways you can both have a broad, general, basic understanding that everybody should have, and then also use that to then build a specialization with one of the, within one of these other practice areas. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Lee. Also clocking in four minutes, 51 seconds, exactly the same for both professors. So <laughs> next, we, by a second. <laughs> next we have Professor Bill Bratton, who will be talking a little bit about business and transactional law. All right, then. Uh, this is your life. Uh, so, so, gee, why, why did I do this? Uh, I, went to a, I went to a good law school. I did well. I went to a big firm. I didn't ask to do it. It asked me to do it. <laughs> and it worked out. Uh, so they're all telling you that you need to take corporations. And 
you need to take corporations if only because it's a prerequisite to a lot of other things. Okay, that, that's one way to think about it. Uh, if you're thinking of taking business courses, get it done first semester, second year, if only because it's a prerequisite. All right, aside from corporations, there are two courses that I think you need to take. One is securities regulation. All right, corporations is a prerequisite to that. Why do you need to take securities regulation? I don't care if you're going to be transactional or if you're going to litigate. It's a big bunch of subject matter. No one is technical. And no one is ever going to take the time to walk you through it. Okay, that's it. You need to know it. It's part of the language of business practice. Okay, so it's a language, a way of thinking that you're being familiar with. All right, the second course, and this is the nasty one for some of you, is accounting. <laughs> that was a very dramatic pause. <laughs> Three credits, Wharton sort of is three credits. Okay. It, it, a lot of people take it. Okay. If, now here's, a lot of you have done finance and accounting as undergraduates. Okay. I don't recommend spending three credits on the Wharton certificate if you're already prepared. There are other things you can do. Okay. I think of the Wharton certificate as being there for people who are uninitiated. All right, it's a very easy way to get initiated. All right, maybe too easy. <laughs> so, there every fall there's an accounting course offered here in the law school. Check the registration figures. A lot of people take it and they take it for very good reasons. It's like securities. No one's gonna walk you through this, and you need to learn the language, okay? So that's technical course number one. There's also a technical course called Corporate Finance. It's a B-School course that Professor Walker teaches. That, I don't think you have to take. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Bratton. Um, next up, we have Professor Mary, who is going to be quite ambitious here. She'll be talking both about employment law and family law. Um, and uh, please, Professor Mary, you have the floor. So I'm going to try to keep this to five minutes total. I'll see how I do. Um, so the first question I want to answer is why take employment law? I'm going to start with employment law. So I think employment law, apart from being an exciting and dynamic area of the law, is one that never goes out of style. Whatever the state of the job market or the economy, employment law is always there. Every year, the Supreme Court decides major cases that touch unemployment-related issues. 
We also all have a stake in employment law. Almost all of us either have been or will be employees at some point in our lives. Some of us will be employers. Some of us will represent employees and employers. Americans spend a tremendous amount of time at work. The job market and the nature of work is changing in profound ways that are fundamentally shaped by the law of the workplace. And the employment relationship also gives rise to a lot of crucial benefits, particularly in the United States, including retirement benefits, health insurance, tax credits, et cetera. So what do our courses on employment law cover? Our courses cover almost every aspect of the legal regulation of the employment relationship. So that includes laws that regulate uh, relationships between employers and employees, um, unions, independent contractors, uh, the government. Um, you will learn in employment-related courses about a lot of major statutes, uh, including the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Americans with Disabilities Act, ERISA, um, I could go on. You'll learn everything from uh, wage and hour law to workplace privacy to at-will employment and its limits, changing definitions of employment in the new economy, uh, to uh, discrimination laws based on race, gender, religion, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, genetic information. You'll learn about legal remedies for harassment, free speech in the public and private workplace, work family policy, uh, accommodations for disabilities, pregnancy, um, et cetera, in the workplace, the role of public and private unions, employee benefits law and its tax implications. You'll also, I think, significantly have the opportunity to learn about various dispute re resolution mechanisms. Um, so in employment law classes, you'll encounter, of course, litigation. You also encounter negotiation, arbitration, conciliation. Um, and uh, significantly, uh, just to um, uh, back up the point that Professor Lee was making, uh, this employment law is an area where administrative law and legislation are really important courses to, to take at some point in your career. Um, I have to say, I did not take administrative law in law school, and it's my probably greatest regret of something that I didn't, um, that I didn't do. Um, so the key courses in this area include uh, a survey course on employment law taught by Professor Lee, um, employment discrimination, which I tend to teach, um, and additional courses uh, that are offered um, fairly regularly, such as employee benefits law, um, litigating employment class actions. Um, we sometimes offer labor law. And we also have terrific seminar uh, offerings in this area. Um, I would also just, I also just want to say there are no prerequisites for these courses. Um, again, I would strongly consider taking courses such as administrative law and legislation, given the importance of both statutory interpretation and regulation to these fields. Um, I would also say, and this uh, piece of advice applies to family law as well, don't wait to take courses um, in this area in order to take them in a particular order. Um, there may be or may not be an ideal order in which to take them, but I would take them when they're offered and you'll do fine. Um, it won't be a problem. Okay, family law. Um, another area in which we all have a personal stake, um, as well as possibly a professional one, and even in the past decade or so that I've been teaching family law, huge uh, and important changes, really transformative <coughs> developments in this field. Um, these courses that we offer uh, include a survey course in family law, which I tend to teach, as well as a course on the Constitution in the family that Professor Dorothy Roberts has taught regularly, several excellent seminars, including a seminar on child parent, uh, children, parents, and the state, um, another seminar on the anatomy of a divorce. Uh, and as these titles suggest, these courses cover everything from marriage and divorce to assisted reproductive technology to abortion regulation to the evolving law on same-sex relationships and parentage, and also the ways in which state regulation affects the family outside the traditional boundaries of family law. So if you're interested in a field in which um, in which you really touch on a lot of different areas of the law, uh, often in a very interdisciplinary manner, areas such as so for social welfare policy, workplace law, even things like zoning regulations, criminal law, and immigration law, um, family laws for you. I also just want to mention um, that we have a nationally renowned child advocacy clinic led by Professor Kara Fink, which I would strongly encourage you to consider whether or not you have any interest in practicing family law in the future. It's really a rare opportunity to engage in truly interdisciplinary work and to develop advocacy skills that will really serve you well, um, really regardless of what area of law you eventually intend to pursue. And I'll end there. Thank you very much, Professor Mayer. All right.
Now we have Professor Wagner who will talk about IP law. Great, thank you. So um, I want to begin by uh, talking to you about why you might want to study in uh, technology and intellectual property, and, and that is because you may think that scientists and engineers are the ones who determine technology, but that's actually wrong. It's the lawyers, right? So that iPhone that you carry around is every bit a, a success of the thousands and thousands of lawyers who worked on it as it is a success related to the technological innovations that go in it. And if that sounds weird to you or crazy, you're right. And that's the reality of the world that we live in, that the lawyers, the modern lawyer is increasingly involved in the day-to-day -day details of how technology gets made, created, implemented, uh, dealt with, sold, et cetera. Um, and the job that we have here at Penn is to make sure that those lawyers that go out there and do that know what they're doing and do it to the best ability and, and uh, do it better than anybody else. So this is why you should study uh, intellectual property law. Um, the other thing to know about IP and technology law is you don't need a technological background. Uh, it can help and there are some areas and some very specific um, areas of, of IP law that having a tech background can help. Now you certainly can't be scared of technology or not like technology because why bother uh, to do that if you don't like technology? But, uh, but certainly don't feel dissuaded in any way if you don't have a, a technological background or some sort of advanced degree. Certainly people do who go into IP, but that's not a requirement uh, at all. In terms of thinking about the course selection, patent law, copyright, trademarks are sort of the core substantive classes. Most people take that during their second year. If you've taken I intro to IP this spring, that's great. Um, that doesn't preclude you from going on to taking some of the higher level courses, but it doesn't also uh, preclude you from taking these substantive courses. And we would recommend doing that kind of thing during your second year as well. There's also courses that are not direct IP courses, but also very heavily related to technology, such as privacy, e-commerce and internet law, telecommunications law. All of those are sort of the core substantive background that, that we would encourage you to take. It's the third year that, at least in the IP program, we feel like is really, really where the fun and the, uh, and the interesting thing is. Um, we have a, a clinic that we work closely with, the De Detkin Clinic on Intellectual Property and Technology, which does IP transactions. It's one of the on only clinics in the country that is specifically designed around this particular aspect of intellectual property law. It uses a lot of the technologies developed here at Penn as the caseload. Uh, so you work with uh, Penn scientists and engineers uh, to bring their technologies to market. Um, we have a new course starting next year that Professor Balganesh is going to do that's going to be on legal scholarship where the product of that course is essentially a journal. Um, you're going to, and so that's a new and, and, and innovative course. I teach a course on appellate advocacy and patent law um, where the, uh, the goal of the course is to compete nationwide and in fact we have uh, students going to, the, um, to Washington DC next week for the national uh, finals. Um, we have a patent litigation simulation course taught by a federal judge and a, and a local high profile patent litigator that takes a course from the start of pretrial motions all the way through uh, instructing the jury on how to do a, 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 a patent uh, litigation. So these are just some of the courses you can take mostly in your third year. There's some options to take these earlier and certainly I'd encourage you to, to take some seminars and things uh, in your second year, but uh, really the second year should be to sort of lay the foundation for what you want to do and then move on up uh, to these advanced things. We also have a fair amount of advanced seminars, uh, advanced copyright theory, the law and economics of intellectual property, intellectual property transactions, pharmaceutical litigation, you name it, we've got a course. We're also always adding new courses. A couple things I'd like to note uh, as well, which is in IP area, we have a very strong um, uh, faculty-driven uh, organization called the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition. That has a big student outreach component. We hire faculty, we hire fellows as part of the CTIC uh, that work with us on the faculty, both on our research and on other projects. Uh, there are summer fellows, uh, fellowship money, and, and other things available. We run a lot of events. We also work really closely with the Penn uh, IP group, PIPG, which does a lot of events as well. So that's uh, the overview of IP and technology, and, and we look forward to seeing you next year. So. All right, thank you, Professor.
Okay, now we have Professor Delille who will talk a little bit about international law. I would like to thank uh, Sophia and uh, Polk for, uh, for putting the best topic last, uh, saving it for the end. Uh, it's the most important one as well as the best one. I'm going to join the parade here of imperialism for one subject. Uh, you are all taking international law, you just don't know it. Uh, international law is, in fact, uh, absolutely uh, everywhere, and increasingly so. That's all the more true if you consider what's sometimes called comparative law, which is the domestic law of other places. Uh, international law is basically the legal side of the stuff you read about in the newspapers every day. Think of the recent Tomahawk cruise missile bombing of Syria. That's about the international law of the use of force, the question of intervention in another state, uh, the role of humanitarian concerns and war crimes as a basis for government action. Think about the immigration ban, which is in the courts now. Uh, that's partly about U.S. obligations toward refugees, or on the other hand, U.S. obligations uh, to participate in the so-called war on terrorism under international law that emerged after 9-11. Think of the summit between Trump and Xi Jinping in Mar-a-Lago last weekend. Uh, North Korea, again, a question of weapons of mass destruction and the international legal regime that limits those, the question of using force perhaps against another state, uh, and the U.S.-China trade issues that came up there, WTO, trade law, treaties, all that sort of thing. The cancellation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, another trade uh, set of issues or rescinding fuel economy standards and removing restrictions on coal-fired power plant emissions, climate change, the emerging areas of international environmental law and the Paris uh, Treaty Accords, or if you like another one, try Russian interference in the American elections, uh, hacking cybersecurity, the international regime uh, for uh, cyberspace, as well as possible changes in what we mean by an attack on another state and old notions of uh, sovereign integrity and a possible human right to democratic governance. Aside from all of this sort of high international law stuff, um, you will have, if you don't already, uh, international and transnational things showing up on your uh, desk as a summer associate or eventually a lawyer. Law firms have foreign offices and foreign clients, more than they ever did before. Government agencies have international work and often international units, and this isn't just the Department of Defense, the Department of State, or the U.S. Trade Representative. It's also Commerce, Justice, Treasury, the EPA, you name it. NGOs have gone transnational. Yes, of course, the human rights NGOs like Amnesty International, Human Rights First, and others who have a big law component in their work, but also access to justice organizations and uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council even has a Beijing office now, so it's really gone uh, global. If you do transactional work, sometimes treaties are going to be very much of what you do. Bilateral investment treaties uh, now do a lot to structure uh, international investment and the commerce that goes with it. Sometimes foreign law will directly govern your deals or transactions. Other times it will affect what the companies you're dealing with can do under the laws of their home countries. Uh, if you try to get your client's IP protected, you're going to have to do it under local IP laws, which are now shaped by the TRIPS agreement, the World Trade Organization's intellectual property set of treaties that set standards uh, for international protection. Uh, you can get into exotic practices like foreign debt restructuring, or you can engage in conventional anti-dumping or anti-subsidy uh, trade law. Litigation, too. Increasing numbers of cases now involve foreign law. Uh, judges bang their heads against their benches these days because they have to listen to people like me and many of my colleagues explain to them how this works in some place they really don't want to deal with. Uh, and beyond that, uh, if you, you will sometimes wind into case, uh, cases where foreign law actually, genuine international law as well as foreign law matters. If you do arbitration, even more so than litigation, you'll see this sort of thing. Uh, some of our peer schools now even require an international course for graduation. I offer that as a humble proposal to my colleagues on the panel here. Um, <laughs> but more than that, international law and foreign law are just good lawyerly training. You've heard it from my colleagues, they're right, but I'm writer. Um, that is to say that uh, international law is one of those where the most basic legal skills are put to the test uh, and how you can shape what you do. Uh, you, you work from a relative handful of extremely complex cases. You have to interpret general principles. Uh, that, that have a lot of flex for interpretation. And if you take comparative law, foreign law, it gives you an outsider's perspective on your own legal system. Uh, in fact, as Dean Fitz once told me after talking to a managing partner at a law firm about what courses you all should be taking, the managing partner said, I don't care if they take Chinese law, something I took as a personal insult, I don't care if they take Chinese law as long as it's a rigorous course. So what should you take? Well, take the basic international law course. It will introduce you to the actors, the processes, and the subject matter of international law. Sometimes I teach that. Sometimes Bill Burke White does. Then there are a lot of advanced courses which get into various subject matter areas of public international law, human rights, trade, environmental law, things like that. 
On the private international law side, what we used to call it, the gateway course is basically the international business transactions course, but there are lots of other courses, transnational M&A, international bankruptcy, conflict of laws, commercial arbitration, both subject and process type courses. Uh, finally, comparative law, that is the law of other jurisdictions. That's one of Penn's strengths. You can take courses on Europe, China, Japan, India, and other places. And finally, I would say don't limit yourself to courses. Think of all the other, certainly don't limit yourself to courses in the law school. There are a wealth of offerings across the university. There are lots of great talks and conferences, lots of centers. Are you to take advantage of that? But if nothing else, take these courses because they address systematically something that has seeped into all of your courses already and is inescapable in any area of legal practice. Unlike many generations of your predecessors, you can't escape being international and comparative lawyers. And most of all, you don't want to disappoint the managing partner who wants you to have taken Chinese law. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor DeLeo. Um, we now have Praveen Kasuri, who will be talking a little bit about, um, who uh, is going to talk a little bit about, and one of the professors left their phone. OK, OK, I'll leave it. Feel free to answer it. OK. Um, so Professor Kasuri is going to talk a little bit about experiential opportunities. Great. So this is uh, Wash Cycle Laundry, which is one of the clients of the Entrepreneurship Legal Clinic. Uh, and we have represented it since its founding. So we, we formed it, we created its governance structure, we negotiated multiple rounds of financing with, with a bunch of different sources of capital. We drafted its customer agreements, both for retail and uh, commercial clients, and in fact, it has a retail arm, so any of you could use Wash Cycle Laundry. Maybe some of you do. Exams are coming up, right? You want clean clothes? Um, we counseled him on uh, his trademarks. We advised him about his expansion to other cities, and he, uh, he uh, runs his business in Philly, D.C., Austin, Texas, uh, Baltimore, uh, and we did a bunch of other things. And when I say we, I mean students, I mean your predecessors, the, the folks that came uh, before you and worked on this client in the clinic. In addition, um, so he's not just any entrepreneur, uh, the, the, uh, the entrepreneur who started this. Um, Wash Like a Laundry is a social enterprise. And what that means is it wants to make the world a better place through its business. And that theme, uh, is one that ties all of our clients in the ELC together. That is, that they, if they are successful, they will have uh, made the world uh, a better place. They will have produced some kind of positive social impact. And in fact, all of our clinics have that thread of social justice and social impact uh, as, as sort of uh, integral to, to what it is that we all do. So Wash Cycle Laundry cares not only about making money, right? It's called a triple bottom line business, people, planet, profit. Um, cares about all of those things. It has 50 employees, uh, including the most marginalized folks uh, amongst our, uh, our populations, formerly incarcerated people, uh, formerly homeless, recovering drug, at, drug addicts, uh, former welfare recipients. Um, those are the people that, that make up Wash Cycle Laundry. It cares about the environment uh, and uses environmentally friendly detergents and cleaners, as well as doing all of its pickup and delivery via bicycle, hence the name. Uh, and yet it's high growth, right? This is a business that wants to, to scale. It wants to expand. Uh, it wants to maximize value, right? All that stuff that you learn in business school, all the stuff that you would learn in the Wharton Certificate Program, um, that's what this business wants to do ultimately. Uh, and by the way, its founder, uh, Gabe, did not go to business school. Um, but he wants, to, uh, he wants to, to maximize value not only for himself, um, but for his, uh, his employees. And so he comes, uh, so he's, Gabe is the entrepreneur. He's the, the founder and also the majority owner of the stock. Um, he wants to share the upside of the business with his employees. He wants to give them a path out of poverty uh, and to success. And he comes to us, the Entrepreneurship Legal Clinic, uh, which means he comes to you, the students, the law student counselors, and he asks us if we can figure out a way to, 
to create a pool of equity that his employees could share in, right? He wants, it, he wants the employees to be eligible for this pool uh, of equity after a year of service, right? So he wants to make sure that they are, in fact, going to be good employees. He wants that equity to, to vest over time, right? So he wants to reward loyalty and longevity. He wants to give them more the longer that they stay. He does have outside investors, and he's not quite sure how they're going to react to this proposal. Um, and he has no idea how to do this or what's involved. But he comes to us, and he wants us to figure it out for him. So that is uh, the essence of what clinics are all about. It's all about problem solving, right? And, and learning to be problem solvers. So, so what's the first step? You have to define the problem, right? Unlike most of your other law school uh, courses, uh, the facts aren't given to you, right? You have to discover the facts. They're gonna change, it's real life, it's dynamic. Then you have to learn some substance, right? In order to diagnose the problem, in order to figure out what it is that needs to be fixed. Learning to learn is the greatest skill that you'll learn from a clinic. Uh, and in fact, I, I argue that if you can master this, you can literally do anything in your careers, right? You're gonna continually have to, to teach yourself new things and figure out what it is you have to know in order to service your clients. And that takes a lot of time, right? Those first two things. Uh, then you get to actual problem solving. And, and here, your job is to find the best solution to the problem. Right, something that's practical, effective, and hopefully meets all of your client's goals. And then lastly, but maybe more, most importantly, you have to translate all of that thinking and analysis into plain English so that your client understands it. You have to explain it to them, you have to respond to questions that they're gonna have, and then ultimately you have to give recommendations which involves using professional judgment. <clears throat> so that's what all of our clinics at Penn give you. Uh, in, in, in their first-hand lawyering experiences. Uh, and we have nine of them. Child advocacy, you heard a bunch of people mention them already. Child advocacy, uh, transnational clinic, IP clinic, civil practice clinic, public defender clinic, a legislative clinic, mediation, the Supreme Court clinic, uh, and then my clinic, the Entrepreneurship Legal Clinic. Thank you very much, Professor Kasuri. We do have a few minutes for questions, and we have a wide array of experts here um, traversing a lot of subject areas. Are there any questions from any first-year students? Anyone, any brave souls? Yes, Christina. Um, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, my quick question is, outside of corporations, are there any other courses that act as a prereq that we should kind of know about for a lot of like upper-level courses? that we might, yeah. So at least in the IP area, most of the third year courses, or several of them anyway, are gonna require the second year pre right, the substantive courses, patent, copyright, trademark, so. Um, so we do have a, a series of prereqs there. I'm not sure about the other areas. I would imagine for tax law, for instance, taking the, basics tax, the basic tax law course is a prerequisite or at least extremely helpful before you get into any of the more advanced tax courses. I, I don't think either, any other, the corporations really is the one that's the, the biggest gateway, but right, the other ones, if you have a sequence, you should identify that beginning course. It appears, given the movement of the audience, that uh, <laughs> it may be time to adjourn. So please join me in warmly thanking all the wonderful faculty that we have here. This is really, really great. Um, and my final point for those of you who are here, this will take 10 seconds. If you go to Academics and Curricular Compass, this is our overview of the curriculum. And if you scroll down, it actually has subject fields like business and transaction law, health law, family law. This is all going to be updated this summer, but if you click on a particular field, you will then be able to read a little bit about what that field is, is, is covering and also classes that relate to that field. I know many of you are going to be very busy studying for finals. Some of you may lose sight of the fact of why you're here. Take a moment to look at this and get a sense of some of the different subject fields that we have here. And thank you again to the wonderful faculty who uh, graciously gave their time to this. And have a very good afternoon. Thank you, guys. <laughs>